right, hello and welcome to another wonderful math lecture. Um, in this lecture we are going to talk about the basics. We're going to look at introduction to integers and we're going to look at a brief introduction into fractions and mixed numbers. Where you start is we need to look at the definitions of the different number systems that you actually have. So there are a variety of different number systems that exist in mathematics and some of those systems are shown here and you have to be able to know the difference between these systems and what is involved in these systems. First and foremost we have natural numbers. Now natural numbers here are called counting numbers. So if you think about the way numbers are taught to um, little kids. So for example, I have a six-year-old and he just finished his uh, kindergarten year, as wild and crazy as it was, and one of the things that he learned um, in pre-k, which helped him a lot with his kindergarten year, was how to count. And of course, you know, learning how to count stems from a very small age. But if you think about the root of it, when we're learning how to count, we always count by starting with one. So whenever we count anything, we always start one, two, three, four. And we count up by, you know, single digits, one after another. And usually little kids will try and see how high that they can go and it becomes a fun game. Well, who knew that counting like that actually had a term, and that term is called natural numbers. Now, natural numbers themselves are represented by a specific variable. It's a very funny looking n variable right here. And as you can see, it is the number set that starts at 1 and just goes on forever. So those are your counting or natural numbers. Now whole numbers is something that most people think of most often. Whole numbers are numbers that do not have decimals, they do not have fractions, they are just those good old fashioned whole numbers. They are represented by this crazy looking W and with that you can see my whole numbers is almost identical to natural numbers but they have one difference. Natural numbers start at one, whole numbers start at zero. And so here that is the single detail that makes the difference between using a whole number set and using a natural number set. Okay, so whole numbers include the number zero, whereas natural numbers don't. Now another system we have is called integers. Integers are the same as whole numbers as they don't use decimals or fractions. They are represented, go figure, by a crazy letter Z. Um, and if you look at its number line, you can see that these numbers here go from the negative infinity side all the way through up to the positive. So essentially they are incorporating every number you have. However, those numbers do not have decimals or fractions. Okay, so again my natural numbers they are only the positives and they start at one. My whole numbers are also only the positives and they start at zero. My integers include everything negative and positive um, with the exception of decimals and fractions. Now this is where the fun begins. Fractions actually have a specific term or a grown-up term. That grown-up term is called rational numbers. Now a rational number is a number that is written in the form of a over b where both a and b are integers. So that right there is very important. A rational number is in a fraction form so it has a top and it has a bottom but both of the numbers from your fraction have to come from your integer set. So it can be any negative or any positive number. However, it cannot be an actual fraction, cannot be a decimal. Now an irrational number is a number that is written as an infinite non-repeating decimal. 
When I think about infinite non-repeating, I think about pi. Pi is one of those decimals, I'm sure you've probably heard of it, that just kind of goes on forever. Well, we like to consider that an infinite um, non-repeating decimal because the numbers are constantly changing. And as it is today, we still haven't figured out where pi actually ends. In fact, um, mathematicians are constantly finding new decimals to add on to the end of where pi currently sits, which is pretty fascinating if you think about it. It also brings a whole new idea to the term infinite. If you take any room in your house and you write out pi in its decimal form all the way up to the last digit that we know of today, that decimal would circle your room multiple times before you get to the end. So that's actually pretty cool. It is infinite. The last number system that you need to keep in mind is the real number system. Now the real number system is like the parent number system. It is the big overarching system. It is a system that includes all of it. And by all of it, I mean it includes all of the rational numbers, it includes all of the irrational numbers. At the same time, it means we are also talking about all of your counting numbers, your whole numbers, your integer numbers. We are talking about all of it, okay? Now, it has its own funky little symbol, and you see me use it fairly often. It is basically the double bar R. So whenever you see that in any math you're doing, um, that means we are talking about all real numbers. And remember, all real numbers are essentially all of your integers, your rational numbers, and irrational numbers all combined together into one happy little family or number system. Now with that we get to do a lot of fun stuff. So first and foremost we have to look at what's called opposite of a number. So we have opposite of a number. Essentially what that means is we are simply taking whatever number you see stamped on your page, we are changing the sign to the opposite sign and rewriting the number. Well with this we only have two signs, positive or negative. So if your number is negative, the opposite would be positive. If your number is positive, the opposite would be negative. Okay, pretty simple. So here I've got three examples of three different types of numbers and of each, all we're going to do is identify its opposite partner. So if I start out with a negative three, my opposite is a positive and the number I had written was a three. Simple as that. Okay, and that's all you're being asked to do. Now here I have a decimal, which is fine. So this one comes from my irrational, well, it comes more from my rational family, but um, irrational works too. But essentially it is the root of a decimal. And here you can see that it's positive. Now, word of caution or word of note, if you do not see a sign next to the number, you can assume it is a positive number. Therefore, in this case, I would have a negative 4.5 to be my opposite. Now last I have a fraction and so again here I'm starting with a negative which means my opposite would be positive and then I just simply need to rewrite the fraction I have which was 5 eighths. And that is all you need to do when you are talking about looking at the opposite of a number. You're just changing that number's sign. Okay. Now things tend to get a little bit interesting when we step into our fractions. So first and foremost, we have three types of fractions, proper, improper, and mixed numbers. A proper fraction is a fraction where the top is smaller than the bottom. An improper fraction is the exact opposite. The top is larger than the bottom. A mixed number is where you're going to take a whole number and slap a fraction onto the back end of it. OK, 
Okay, so we're talking about it's actually the sum of your whole number and a fraction, and that is going to create your mixed number. Now, to do this, we have to look at first interchanging back and forth between improper and mixed numbers. The reason we do that is to make solving our equations and working with um, equations or expressions a little bit easier. So you need to know how to go back and forth. So first, let's look at a mixed number. And the question says, how do you change a mixed number to an improper fraction? Well, the uh, official way to do it says you are going to take your denominator and you are going to multiply by your big number, okay, i.e. the whole number, and then you are going to add it to the numerator. And then you are going to place it So you're going to place that new number as your new numerator and divide by your existing denominator. Okay. Well, that's big and fancy. I like to boil it down a little bit. What we are actually doing here is we are going to take the bottom and we're going to times the big number and then we are going to add to the top. Now, what's really important here when we are looking at this is that when we are talking about this big number, you need to ignore the sign. So when we are trying to do this, the first thing you want to do is you want to ignore the sign of the problem you just want to change it over and then you'll input the sign in at the end. Okay. So, how exactly do we do that? Well, we need to identify what exactly is your bottom number, your big number, and your top number. So, let's look at the bottom number. My bottom number is your denominator. So in this case, it would be an 8. My big number is just that, it's the big number. Now remember I'm going to ignore the sign, so it is a three. And then when we're talking about top, well that's my numerator, so in this case it would be a five. So in order to interchange this, I just simply have to put these numbers where they belong. So I have bottom number, so eight, times my big number, which is 3, add it to my top number, which is 5. So if I add this up, I have 8 times 3, which is 24, plus 5. Again, add that up, and I get 29. So what do I do with that? Well, I place the new number on top and divide by the denominator. So here, I'm going to place the 29 as my numerator. I'm going to divide by my denominator or the bottom number, which was 8. And now the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to slap that sign back onto my fraction. And this is my improper fraction. Okay. Now once you go one direction, you have to be able to go the other direction. So we also have to be able to take an improper and change it over to its mixed number partner. Again, we want to ignore the sign until the end. So the fact that this is negative, we're going to totally ignore that, and we are just going to focus on the two numbers that we have. Well, what we're going to do here is we are going to use old school 
division. Yep, I said it. We are going old school. Old school says we have that fun little division sign. And then when we are filling things in, our top goes inside, our bottom goes outside, and our result goes on top of the division sign. Okay. So let's go ahead and look at this. So I'm going to draw my division sign here. I'm going to make it a little bit fun. And so here my top is a 28. So I'm going to input 28 on the inside. My bottom was 13. So I'm going to put a 13 on the outside. And you guessed it, we are going to do old school division. So if you remember, old school division says you take the number on the outside and you say how many times does that number go into this first digit, so the 2. Well in this case it doesn't, so now I have to look at two digits. So I want to know how many times does 13 go into 28? Well in this case it happens to be twice because 13 times 2 is 26. So I put the 2 on top because it goes in twice. Remember you take the number on top times the number on the outside and subtract it. So I have to subtract away my 26 and this is going to give me my remainder. So 28 minus 26 is a 2 which means right now I have a remainder of 2. Okay, so some of you may be thinking, well, but that's not exactly a fraction. And that's true, it's not. So this is how it becomes your mixed number. When we are talking about a mixed number, we are talking about a number that has the form, say, large number A. And then we've got a little number B over a little number C. Okay. So what do we know? Well, we know that the large number here comes from the whole number result of long division. That's how you get your whole number or the big term. Your numerator here comes from the remainder. Of long division. And then your denominator here is going to be the same bottom you started with. Okay. So that's how we create our mixed numbers. So here you can see my whole number is a 2, my remainder is a 2, and my denominator is a 13. So when I'm looking at this overall result, I have my whole number is a 2, so I've got a big 2. My remainder is also a 2, so I have a little 2 on top. The denominator I started with was a 13, and then remember it was negative in the beginning. And so this would be your mixed number. Now for most um, fractions that you work with, you have to be able to be very fluent going back and forth between mixed numbers and improper fractions. So you do want to make sure that if you're somebody who struggles with fractions, um, 
that you definitely, if you're doing this for a class, you take some extra practice, spend some extra time, and figure out uh, which way of thinking about this math makes the most sense to you. Okay. Now, another thing that we do a lot of when dealing with beginning numbers is we like to do what's called graph on a number line. So again, we are still taking a walk back um, through our elementary days and using these math concepts that we used a long, long time ago, way back in the beginning. And one of those is using a number line. So what we're going to look at real quick is how do we actually set up a number line? Well, a number line is a line that has a collection of points, okay, called coordinate points. Essentially, it's a collection of dots, and each dot represents an actual number. So here, if we want to put dots on a number line, there's a few things that we need to remember. First and foremost, we need to remember that my number lines are going to start from negative infinity and travel all the way through to the positive. Now when I'm creating number lines, one of the things that I like to do is I like to input my zero somewhere on the number line because that's your frame of reference that tells you where to start. And so what we need to do is we need to go ahead and just kind of set in some points. So we're ignoring what we have um, in our set right here and we're just simply making a number line and you're going to make a number line out of integers. So here we've got 0, we've got a 1, we've got a 2, maybe we're going to go to 3. The three dots on the end signify that your number line continues on, it doesn't stop. And then we need to go back the other way. So we're going to go a negative 1, a negative 2, negative 3, I still have space, so negative 4, and again, putting those three dots does signify that that number line continues on. And so now we need to graph our points. So we're going to go ahead and look at them. So the first point I have here is negative 3.4. So I'm going to come down here to negative 3, and 3.4 is going to be almost halfway between 3 and 4, so it's going to sit somewhere about right there, and we're just going to go ahead and draw a dot and be cool with it. Now the next thing I have is I have a negative 2, so I'm going to go ahead and come over here to negative 2, and again I'm going to draw myself a dot. I then have negative 0.5. So that's going to be halfway between 0 and negative 1, so that one's going to sit right here. I then have 1, so that sits right there. And then I have 5 halves. One advice that I can give you is that when you're dealing with fractions, it is very simple to convert your fraction to a decimal. Now you can do that using long school division. or most um, basic algebra courses allow you to have um, a calculator. And so if you have a calculator, you could simply do 5 divided by 2 on your calculator. And what you're going to find is 2 and a half. Well, 2 and a half sits halfway between 2 and 3, so it would sit roughly here. And since all we're supposed to do is create our number line, this is what it would look like. So you've got your number line in, you've put your points in so that your number line is set, and then you've graphed the dots that you had in your set here. Now sometimes this set will be contained, and sometimes this set won't. So if you notice in this one, we're talking about all integers that are less than or equal to zero. So again, we need to set our number line. So we're going to go from the negative through to positive infinity. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to set my zero and then I'm going to fill in my number line. So from zero I'm going to count up one, two, three, 
and I'm going to go ahead and input my dots, which signify again that you're going on forever. I'm going to do that in the opposite direction. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and for good measure, negative 4, and we're going to keep going. Now again, we need to graph our number lines. So we are graphing our dots. So we are going to go ahead and we are going to put a dot everywhere that we fall within our guidelines. Now for this, my guidelines are talking about all integers that are less than or equal to zero. So remember, integer is that crazy Z and it was talking about your negative numbers up through the positive. So if I want integers that are less than or equal to zero, then what that actually means is that the only numbers I care about are going to be these numbers where I'm going to include zero and I'm just including the negatives. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to draw dots on what I can see. So I've got zero, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. Of course those are what I see but I'm going all the way down through infinity. So I'm going to continue on in that direction. Okay. So that is creating a graph of a number line using the information that was provided to you. Now when we're dealing with absolute values I do have to say that absolute values are one of my favorite things to show examples of um, and to teach and there's a few things that we have to pay attention to. First is that the absolute value in itself is actually a measure of distance. A number is from zero on a number line specifically. Now, the basic rule for absolute value says that the value should be positive. Okay. So what exactly does that mean? Well, when we're talking about a value being positive, what we're saying is that whether you're positive or negative when you enter the absolute value you come out positive either way. Okay. So to help make that clear, back when I was first learning algebra myself, I had a teacher and we all thought that he was totally crazy. And the reason we thought that is because he teaches absolute values using what he called a shower. And this is what he would say. He would say, here is your shower. Because remember, absolute values kind of look like the stalls of a shower. And with that, let's say for example, you got up in the morning and your daily routine when you get crawl out of bed and your eyes are not even open is you walk over and you get into the shower. Now of course first I would hope that you would say take your pajamas off but then again that is me assuming you sleep in pajamas. So to each their own I don't want to know but you get into your shower. Now again this is also assuming that you're somebody who when you stand in the shower you actually turn the water on. Now again I don't want to know to everyone their own. Um, but in most cases, we turn the water on. So when we got into the shower, it did not appear as though we had anything on us. At least that would be my hope. Um, we turn this water on, you wash down, or you just simply stand there and beat on your face and wake you up. But when you get out and you dry off, you generally looked to the visual spectrum the exact same as you did when you got into it except for maybe now your hair is wet instead of 
frizzy and crazy like mine is when I get up every day. Now, let's say you have a six-year-old son. And let's say that six-year-old son decided that he wanted to find the only mud hole on his playground. Now my six-year-old son goes out to St. Andrews, which is a good 45 minute drive for me to drop him off, pick him up, okay, sacrifice I make. Now let's just say that day after it's rained a ton, my son went out and found the only big giant mud puddle that he could find on the entire property within the confines of his playground. And being that my son is a very curious young little boy, he decided that he was going to spend his playground time with some of his buddies jumping in that mud puddle. And let's say to my surprise, I have no idea, you know, nobody's called to tell me and so I drive to pick up my son from his school and of course being a loving mother get out of my car in order to wait for him and then here comes my son running out of the um, school playground and jumps into my arms and lo and behold was caked in mud from head to toe and so now me who at that time had to be able to go back to work I also am now caked in mud all over my clothes and like I mentioned before this is a 45 minute drive and since I had no idea that he was caked in mud there's no towels in my car so I'm sure you can picture the mess that was my drive home that day and I'm guessing by you listening you've already kind of figured out that I'm the type of person that likes to rant about true stories in her life okay so what's the point here's the point we finally get home and I get my mud caked son out of the back of the car and the first thing of course I do is I go and put him in the shower and he is still caked in mud from head to toe and therefore we like to say he is negative he has got all this extra stuff all over him and even when I stripped all his clothes off of him he was still caked in mud from head to toe from jumping and so being a good mom you know you would like to think that I turned the water on and used soap and rinsed it all off and of course mud does what mud does best goes down the drain in your shower so when my son got out of that shower you never would have known that he had been caked in mud just minutes prior because he was all squeaky clean he was back to being positive so what is the moral of my little rant my crazy shower story no matter what value goes in whether it's a positive or a negative value when you apply the absolute value to that number it comes out as a positive result it cannot come out negative it's not possible okay so what you have to be able to do in the beginning is you have to be able to look at some absolute values and you have to do what's called evaluate the absolute value so I have the absolute value of negative 5 when you apply the rule your absolute value is going to come out as the positive. It comes out as five. The negative washes away and leaves only the positive behind. If I go in positive, say a positive three halves, when I come out, I am still a positive three halves. Now, here's something that's a little tricky. When we look at this one, notice I have a negative on the outside so the first thing I have to do is do my absolute value rule my absolute value rule says even though it's a negative 12 inside my absolute value washes the negative away and a 12 comes out however we had this negative here so once you apply 
your absolute value rule, if you have a negative outside the absolute value, that would be the same as if my son just got out of the shower, was all squeaky clean, and went out into my backyard and jumped in a new mud puddle. You stay negative. Now this one, if you notice, these are parentheses. So this one is multiplication. This one is not absolute value. So here we're just simply multiplying. Negative times negative gives you a positive result. So you need to pay very close attention. Are your bars straight up and down or are they slightly curved? Straight up and down means you use the absolute value rule. If there's a curve to it, it means it's a parenthesis and that means multiply. Now that is evaluating. Listing solutions is a totally different matter. Listing solutions says you need to take the positive and the negative into an account. So what are the ways that I could come up with 12 as an answer? Well, in order to do that, x would have to be negative 12 or positive 12. So in this case, I have two solutions because it, either one goes into my absolute value, 12 comes out. Now in this case, I have a negative 6x. In this case, we have that y is no solution. The reason for that is because by the definition of absolute values, the absolute value of x cannot be negative. Okay. It cannot equal a negative result. Therefore, if it does, you have violated the absolute value rule. Now, the last place that we're going to stop on our introductory um, road is we're going to look at comparing numbers. So comparing numbers uses the definitions less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, or just plain out equal to. And so here you need to be very careful when you're comparing your numbers. The biggest hint that I can provide is to think of the number line. and where your numbers actually were to fall on it. Okay, So here I have negative 67 and I have negative 50. So if I think of a number line, if I were to draw it out, I know I have negative infinity to positive infinity. This over here is small. This over here is large. If I put my zero in the middle, what do I know? I know that if I start counting up on this side, I count up, one, two, three, and so on and so forth. If I count on the negative side, I still start with one, and it appears as though I'm counting down. Okay. What that means is the larger the negative number, the smaller the value actually is. So if I wanted to compare negative 67 to negative 50, negative 67 appears to be a larger number, but the negative means my sign goes in that direction. Okay. Now for my second one, I have negative 3 fourths and negative 1. So again, I already drew this number line here, so I could look at it. When I'm looking at my number line, negative 1 falls right here, but 3 fourths is the same as say 0.75, so that's going to fall between 0 and negative 1, which means negative 1 is actually the smaller value. Thus, we go this direction. 
Now, when you're dealing with the positive, whether it's a positive fraction, a positive number, positive decimal, essentially we're on the positive side of the number line, which means the larger the number gets, the bigger it actually is. So when I'm comparing 2.4 and 3.2, 3.2 is going to be the larger number that I would want to eat. Now, dealing with um, two-thirds and five-ninths, one of the easiest things to do, if you can't do it in your head, is to translate them into um, decimals so that you know which one is going to be bigger. Never assume, okay? So when we are talking about two-thirds, we are talking about the numbers negative 0 0.67 where that is repeating. And when we are talking about 5 ninths, we are talking about negative 0 0.55 and that's repeating. So again, even with our decimals, the bigger the number, the smaller the negative actually is. Therefore, we would go in this direction. Now we have the absolute value of negative 7 is what compared to 7? Well, if we actually evaluate that absolute value, remember evaluating says whatever goes in, the positive comes out. Therefore, this one is equal. And last but not least, we have, is this true or false? The negative of the absolute value of negative 3 is less than the negative of the absolute value of 4. So what we have to do is we actually have to kind of solve this a little. So I have negative of the absolute value of negative 3. I'm saying that's less to negative the absolute value of 4. So the first thing I need to remember is that I have this negative on the outside of both sides, so that can't be forgotten. I need to evaluate my absolute value. So the absolute value of negative 3 is 3. I can't forget my negative, so I need to apply it. And this is what I'm testing. Is this true? So now I need to evaluate the other side. I have 4. I need to apply the negative. So this is a negative 4. So is it true that negative 3 is less than negative 4? Well, this would be false. Negative 3 is actually larger than negative 4. Alright, so that is kind of everything in a nutshell about the introduction to some different number systems and the introductions into some fractions and mixed numbers that you may be using. Okay, so if you have any questions, please make sure that you let me know. And remember, math is bananas. So just keep smiling, ask tons of questions, and have fun with your math. I'll see you next time.